Hi, this is uh, Michael DeRosa with uh, Coffeeville Community College. I'm the Visual Art Director and I'm going to uh, make another video on using charcoal to do a drawing. Uh, we're going to be working from the still life today and so this will be the still life that we're working from. So I'm going to be making a drawing in response to this can and uh, we'll be using again uh, 80 pound paper and so we'll be working from the easel right here and then the medium that we're going to be using is vine charcoal and so here is the charcoal that I'm going to be using and then I'll be using an eraser an eraser an eraser and maybe a smudging stick I'm not a big fan of those but sometimes I do use those uh, and so I'm going to be working right here this would be uh, the format that we're working from uh, we're going to be working uh, horizontally uh, on this piece of paper uh, in response to uh, that that given still life. So again, uh, this is uh, this is how we're going to be uh, working. Uh, <clears throat> uh, as I work, I will be talking and uh, trying to share with you the, the the choices and the reasons of why I'm doing what I'm doing. Um, <clears throat> we're going to be working from a, a model of space that's called value contrast, and I do want to at some point in time put up a make another video or a lecture that is just about that uh, explaining to you uh, uh, the models of space. Uh, when I was in graduate school I had a professor named Dr. Gregor, Dr. Hill Gregor, and he will be the one that really introduces that type of thinking uh, uh, to me and uh, I think it gives you as the artist so much power in understanding exactly what you're doing. And so there's four models of space. I don't want to get into it right now, but there's four models of space. One is value contrast. Value contrast is the first and the oldest model of space that started all the way back in prehistoric times. And it went all the way up until 1863 when Manet, M-A-N-E-T, will invent uh, the philosophy of Impressionism. And so from prehistoric times, 20,000 BCE, if you will, just based on carbon dating, all the way up to 1863, the only model of space that existed was value contrast. And so your eye sees about 32 different values, and it's based on the idea that um, we have depth perception based on those values. And so 10 values academically on a flat piece of paper is considered the, the common goal to have good, a good sense of illusion on this flat plane, but value contrast is what makes space. The second model of space was Hugh Contrast, that was with the Impressionist artist, and they will uh, make the illustration take a back seat, and back seat, and the formal properties will be elevated, and so that will shape space with Hue Contrast, and so Hue's uh, like uh, red and green are complementary colors, blue and orange and violet and yellow. Those complementary colors will shape space, they have a push and pull effect. They, the word complementary is kind of ironic, it doesn't really fit uh, because they don't complement each other, they really fight each other. And then the third model of space was in 1907 with Picasso, Georges Braque with Cubism, and then 1945 with the Abstract Expressionist Movement, Jackson Pollock uh, kind of heading it up uh, with tonal layer space. And those are the only four models of space that exist, so you if an artist are going to make a visual uh, communication, some type of image, it has to fit one of those four models of space. There is no other. And so if it's going to be two-dimensional, it has to be the value contrast, hue contrast, cubism, or tonal, tonal layered space. Uh, Dr. Gregor did talk about a guy named Frank Stella who was introducing the idea of luminosity. However, that model of space was never fully developed. And then 1980, postmodernism exists or, or occurred, which is basically a recognition that anything new and innovative formally has been fully explored and there's nothing left new to do. And so that leaves us with four models of space to visually communicate with you. At some point in time, I plan on making a lecture uh, based on on uh, that model of space using examples of the history of art to help help it make sense to you. But anyway, nonetheless, let's go ahead and do the drawing today. When I draw, I always teach a baseline structure lines. A baseline is basically a non-committed line, loose, and it's just kind of a sketchy feel line, and everything I do is based on uh, direct observation. And so I'm looking at the can, 
uh, that I'm drawing from. Trying to work out the composition. Uh, I am utilizing the real thirds. Notice where I put the central axis of the can is in the right one third mark. And so, and so we're just going to kind of fit that in here. And, um, and then I'm using psychological balance with the pour spout over here, uh, giving it a place to move or, or look into. And so we're just kind of loosely sketching all this in. Nothing I'm doing is committed. And uh, I am uh, thinking this way, or thinking about uh, the space at this point in time. How is this going to fit the space? How does it fit the, uh, interact with the outside edges of the picture plane? Etc. Those things are of great concern to me right now. And so, at some point in time, if I get quiet in this video, it's just because uh, I'm starting to really get into the drawing. I'm thinking more about that than I am making a video. And so, uh, please don't be insulted by that. And not really, uh, that's definitely not a goal or an aim. all aspects of the can just kind of roughing in the detail so I'm pretty satisfied with that important part of the composition is having a horizon line the back edge of the picture plane is going to be over here and then I noticed that <clears throat> that kind of intersects my can about right here and um, maybe that can come up here just a little bit so I'm just kind of feeling it out so uh, I am going to set up the space, reverse chiaroscuro, chiaroscuro is an Italian word, just simply means modeling light to dark. I'm going to set up the space, reverse chiaroscuro, where the background is going to read darker than my foreground. And so space has illusion of receding back here in the background. Up above the horizon line, this space has to average out to be darker than this space in here. And so that is how I'm going to set up my space. So I'm putting in my cat, just kind of mapping out where my shadows go, my folds go, things of that nature. I'm going to switch to a little bit thicker piece of charcoal. Uh, hopefully we start playing this in just a little bit quicker. And so one kind of thing in the background is going to be dark. And I'm just kind of filling this in right now. I'm not really just filling it in, I'm just laying in what artists in the 1700s called the ground. And so I'm just laying in a value. It's going to serve as a background. This is not going to be a finished part of the drawing per se. It's just giving me a quick sense of space. And this is a virtue of charcoal. I have a lot of students when they start off drawing. They always say, oh, I don't like charcoal. It's too messy. I don't feel in control. But uh, charcoal is a very quick sketching medium. And then that is just sketching. It's a finished medium, too. Robert Longo, uh, I'm kind of one of those quiet supporters of him. I know it's not necessarily a good idea to admit you like Robert Longo in the intellectual circle because uh, conceptually there's not a lot of thought put in his work but I am a very strong secret admirer of Robert Longo Still just kind of sketching out the object, focused on the outside edges of the plane. And it's, this is in shadow over here. quickly putting that in and 
So sometimes it really helps if you just state the obvious quickly in your drawing, and that helps you get answers to things that are a little bit more difficult or time consuming to develop. That's uh, threading on the top of my cap. Another professor at Oklahoma State University. I went to school at Oklahoma State University. I was a graphic design major, graduated high school in 83. I didn't really know why I wanted to go to college. All my friends were going to college, so I felt like it might be a good thing for me to pursue as well. Um, and I went to school at Oklahoma State University. That's where all my friends were going, so I enrolled there too. I didn't really know what, what I wanted to do. Uh, I had a high school guidance counselor that told me if I wanted to make any money at art, uh, that I had to study graphic design, so I enrolled in graphic design. Um, it was okay. Uh, while I was in graphic design, though, I took a painting class, which was taught by a guy named Dean Bloodgood, and uh, I don't know why, but uh, one Saturday night I kind of broke into the art department, not telling anybody that, but we weren't supposed to be up there on the weekends at night. And, uh, I had a lady, and I can't remember her name, but anyway, she was a visiting artist, and she left a bunch of large canvases, and uh, I stretched up a canvas. It probably really wasn't that big. It was probably something like four foot by six foot. That was large to me and stretched it up. And I did a painting in one night. It was a horrible painting. Uh, at least the results were horrible. But for whatever reasons, when uh, um, I got done, when I was in the process of doing that painting, for some reason I felt like it was the most heroic thing I'd ever done before. I'm not sure why, but that's when I really fell in love with uh, the idea of two-dimensional art and painting. And uh, still didn't know that I was going to go into graduate school to study the fine arts, but nonetheless, I did. And uh, I got I, well. I did another. I did an apprenticeship. Let me back back up. So anyway, when I was at Oklahoma State University, I. I was fortunate enough and I got to do an apprenticeship at a company in Oklahoma City called The Graphic Edge. And uh, um, that's when I realized at that point in time I did not want to be um, uh, a graphic artist. They stepped me in the dark room and back in those days they didn't have, nobody had computers, it wasn't digital. And they stepped me in the dark room doing this thing called PMTs, which is basically you're making a photograph with of a of a photograph of a photograph with a queer piece of plastic over it with so many dots per square inch, and the more dots per square inch, and the higher the resolution. So basically, you're making a photograph of, of an image with dots, so the printing press could read it. Otherwise, the printing press couldn't read the tones. And so that's what a PMT was. They stepped me in a dark room doing that all day long. I realized at that point in time that I was much more interested in the creative process, the expressive process of art, and decided I wanted, did not want to do that. But nonetheless, I went back to Oklahoma State University um, to finish up just because I was so close to graduating. This was in the summer of 86. I graduated in 87 from Oklahoma State. And lo and behold, I had another contest, which was at um, Universal Limited Art Edition in New York. And you had to apply for that to the art competition. I don't know how I won, but I was lucky enough that I won. I applied for the contest I won, and I got to go to Manhattan, New York, and work for Uni Universal Limited Art Edition for a period of six months. And that was probably the best part of my entire education. Uh, Universal Limited Art Edition was owned by uh, Bill Golston at the time, Jasper Johns, 
and uh, I think those are the two main owners of the Universal Lone Star District. Jasper Johns was the father of pop art in the United States, and uh, so he was very uh, big and powerful as far as being an owner of that company. And then Bill Goldston uh, did a great job managing it. And uh, then some of the other artists that worked there was like Jim Dine, uh, Tim Dunham. Uh, oh, I can't think of her name. Uh, Ellen Murray was another artist that worked there also. These are art that we did uh, prints for. So what ULAE is, is Universal Lone Star Edition, is a company that does prints for the fine artists. And so uh, Craig Zamarillo was a master printmaker there. Uh, I remember him for sure. Um, Phil, I can't remember Phil's last name, but he was another printmaker, master printmaker there. And so these, these were uh, artists per se, that gave themselves over to the process of making prints, and they were there to, solely to help the artists like Tim Dunham, Jim Dine, uh, make prints. And so that's that's what they saw their golden light be. Um, anyway, I worked there with these artists. They would have me uh, come in. I lived in Manhattan, New York, in a studio uh, that that is ULA has there. And then I would take a train to the subway to Penn Station, the number one train to Penn Station every morning. Uh, that was on 42nd Street. And then I would ride the train uh, to Long Island, which is Bayshore and West Islip, where the studios are located there. Get a company car, go drive back into the city, pick up an artist uh, like Tip Dunham, and uh, maybe that day, and drive them back to the studios. That might be a job I had to do that day. And then, um, and it was a great deal. It was a really good, good deal because for um, my, at my hours of service, uh, they paid for all my room and board. And I got $100 cash a week for spending that I didn't have to turn in or account for. Kind of like gratuity. And then, um, um, whatever I needed in terms of food items. If I saved my receipts, turned them in, I would be reimbursed. And so it's a really, really good deal. And uh, on the weekends, I didn't have anything to do. Oh, Susan Rothenberg lived right upstairs from me. She was also an artist that worked at ULAE. She lived right upstairs from me. I lived at 138 Watt Street. And uh, she showed me where to get my hair cut for a cheap price, where to eat cheap. and things of that nature and so Susan Susan was a super nice lady and you can never tell that she thought she was above anybody else based on how she treated people so she was super she showed me where to eat uh, eat cheap showed me how to eat in Chinatown which is right down the road uh, showed me how to ride the subway and things of that nature and so she was super nice to me and I, I owe her a lot as far as how she helped me uh, Get around. That was a small town Oklahoma kid <clears throat> and scared to death when I moved into the city. So that was kind of a rude awakening for me. So anyway, while I was at ULAE, I asked all the artists. I was really quiet, and so they would tell me all their secrets per se, their problems and things that bothered them in life. I didn't say anything back, I just listened, and uh, uh, I would quietly ask them what should I do to be like them, and hands down, the universal answer I got, number one, was to draw, the second answer I got from them was to go to graduate school, and so uh, when they told me to draw, I didn't understand what they meant, and I said, like, draw what, and, and that was just because I was very immature. And now I understand they just meant draw anything. So drawing is the key, it's the foundation of all things in the visual arts. And so anyway, I uh, applied to graduate school, got accepted at Illinois State University, um, went there at a great time. 
met some great colleagues that were very serious about art. We really inspired each other a great deal. And Al Dvorak, Doug Johnson, Doug DeWitt, David Stratton, uh, Dan Addington, those were all colleagues, uh, Alfonso Mulaney, uh, these were all colleagues of mine at Illinois State. And I don't know how, but our professors, which was at the time uh, Kenneth Holder, uh, Dr. Cheryl Gregor, uh, Ray George, uh, Jim Butler, they all had us somehow convinced, uh, Ron Jackson convinced that we were going to be the next uh, leading artist in the world. And so we, we lived and breathed art for about five years there. And we, we definitely thought we were going to be the next great artist in the world. And uh, so we drew all the time, we painted all the time, we were serious. We, we're really serious about the art we made. We thought about it. We philosophized. We <clears throat> criticized each other, helped each other, encouraged each other any time that we could. And uh, Betty Plumley, another colleague of mine. And so uh, we were all in the, in, heavily engaged in the process of being the next world renowned artist. Uh, most of us are still doing something related to art, which is uh, statistics put out by Yale and Harvard said that only one out of every 20,000 that graduate with the MFA actually do anything related to art. So I'm teaching art and drawing and painting and, and photography and ceramics and chainsaw carving. And I'm kind of a weird artist that way. I do lots of different things. Going on, probably about uh, two thirds of the way down with this guy. I'm really starting to focus more on the light and the shadow, the atmosphere. I got roughly established in the guy, I'm pretty happy with that. And so I am focused on light properties and atmosphere. Uh, all these are. are so I, I treat art as a science, so if you don't think your drawing's good, you can always run through a checklist, how many values do I have making up the space, the atmosphere. Your goal academically is to, to have about 10 that make up that space. Um, and then your object or subject matter, in this case, I got a singular subject matter, uh, it should have uh, all six light properties in its makeup. And, and so the light properties are the area of light, which here's my area of light in here. And then in the area of light, you always have a highlight. That's the brightest part of the, of the subject matter. Uh, and then I have my shadow area. This is my shadow area. Here's my core shadow, reflective light, cast shadow. So right in here, this has a pretty decent sense of volume just because I have all six of those light properties present. They're not as enhanced as well as they could be, but that's why I'm still working on the drawing. And so, but that's what my focus is, is to start to really develop these, these things in, in, a, in a key form. I wish you guys could ask me questions and I can answer them, but since this is a video, not a live chat, I can't do that. So maybe one of these days I'll figure out how to do that and we'll do a live chat and if I can get some people to log in at the right time. Uh, the live chat and you guys can ask questions and, and uh, I can answer them. Love charcoal and that's so easy to manipulate on the surface. So anyway, 
then I uh, graduated uh, Illinois State University uh, in 1990 with a Master of Science degree and then I graduated again in 1992 with a Master of Fine Arts degree, Concentration in Painting, won the Marshall Delaney Picture Award at Illinois State University. It's quite an honor. That's the highest award you can get at Illinois State at the time. Then, uh, this college at Coffeyville Community College in 1994 uh, called me up, asked when I needed a job, and uh, said God answered my prayers and gave me an opportunity to come and teach at Coffeyville Community College. I really just wanted to stay here about three years from my experience, and then wanted to um, then I was wanting to move on to a bigger college, and but here I am, and so this seems to be a good fit for me. And so I've been here ever since. So I'm kind of building up the drawing with that in mind. So I do like to do that. That's kind of my so kind of over exaggerate and then come back in and take away. Also secretively a pretty big fan of Jim Dine and what he did with the drawing. And I know intellectually he didn't have a whole lot to offer that way. Sometimes he's better off than he didn't speak at all. But I did like what he did with drawing, the drawing process. I feel like he was one of the innovators where he took the drawing process to a whole other level of beyond illustration uh, just by trying to make the drawing process so physical. like the sense of space I have going on and it's a movement within the drawing.
about the values right now. And so everything I do is in response to what I see. There's two really good books out. One is that I think I'm drawing. I agree with one is David Sal. Drawing a contemporary approach, and then the other is uh, the responsive approach. Drawing, can't think of the author's name on that. I don't use that in the classroom. It seems, a, it seems a little advanced for the average student I have. back in here. Starting to get to a point where I'm starting to think about calling it finished. That's a Van Gogh, one of my favorite expressive artists, or first expressive artist, that I shall exaggerate the essential things and I'll leave the obvious things vague. Like so, the racer comes in, in and out. Pretty cool.
graduate school. Um, I worked with a guy named Kenneth Holder. He just recently passed away. Very sad. But he used to frustrate me when I get frustrated on my paintings or drawings. He'd say, after all, it's just a bunch of just patterns of lights and darks. And that's all the drawing is. Responding to the surface on this hand. Really cool marks going on. Okay, I think we're about done with this drawing. Sign my name. So here's the drawing we ended up with, uh, about a 30 minute drawing. And so this is the finished product of the drawing, uh, made with, again vine charcoal. And then here again is my subject matter from the still life. And so thank you for watching, um, and I wish I could answer your questions, but I cannot. So I hope you enjoyed, and somehow this is inspirational to you as a learning experience. Thank you.